So this morning, like I said, um, every service is different. Um, we never plan anything like this. Um, we always pray, we always worship, but sometimes God just comes and He just changes the way we think church should look like. And uh, that's what we live for. That is what we live for. We don't want to put you in a, in a box and say, this is what church is like. So next week when you come here, maybe it's going to look different. We hope so. Because it means God has moved on. Amen. But here's the thing. Jesus will never, ever leave you at a place he hasn't made provision for you. So the next time when we walk into church, Jesus was already here. Oh, Jesus was already here, already made provision. You just need to tap into that, tap into the supernatural so that that will become natural to you. Amen. So here we go. So the Sermon on the Mount is one of the best sermons that Jesus ever preached. Has anybody ever heard of the Sermon on the Mount? That was the, the biggest sermon Jesus ever preached. He started off with something like that. Happy is a man. Happy is a man. Happy is a man. Happy is a man and a woman. Happy is a man. Happy is a man. Happy is a man. Happy is that man. <laughs> okay, happy is the man. So he starts off with this thing uh, where he, the, the crowd gathered and Jesus was making a provision or Jesus um, started preaching a sermon to change the way people thought God was like. So the moment we reach the Sermon on the Mount, you can read it from Matthew 4, Matthew 4, 5, 6, 7, actually from Matthew 5, of, it's more interesting, from Matthew, Matthew 5, of, you'll read the Sermon on the Mount. It's a good sermon. It teaches you how you, to, how you should live your life. And here's the thing, many of us see the Sermon on the Mount as the as a idea that Jesus presented heaven or hell for you. So Jesus, I mean, the moment he, 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 he presented the sermon, he was actually saying, listen, I want you to think about this, heaven or hell. And let me tell you today that uh, the sermon on the, on the mount was nothing to do with heaven and nothing to do with hell. It was a concept that Jesus came and said, this is how you should do life. This is how you should live your life. And I do understand that you got uh, this, this whole idea. Let me just tell you, okay, let's just start. Can I have this on, please? So nobody can think that I am talking nonsense or whatever. In the beginning of Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said something about the salt. You are the salt of the earth. To bring flavor where you go. My own, my own translation. You are the salt of the earth. Bring flavor. And then he said something like this. He said, the moment you don't bring flavor... What will he do? You're good for nothing then. You're good for nothing the moment you don't bring flavor anymore. So here's the thing. So many of us think to ourselves, God, um, so how does it look like when I bring flavor to anything? Should I bring in my worship music? Should I pray for everybody in my workplace? Jesus, should I start every scripture with this say of the Lord? God, how does it look like when I bring flavor to my world? How does, does it look like when I bring flavor to my surroundings? How does it look like when I bring flavor? Because here's the thing, I don't know if you ever thought about this. How does it look like when I bring flavor to my surroundings? And how much flavor is enough? How much flavor is enough when people don't say, listen here, I can't stand you and your Bible anymore. I want, to, and then we think as you're really charismatic, you think, oh, well done. Because they first rejected Jesus and now they rejected me. If you're missing the point. God's whole business is people. And he says, go and make, a, go and make uh, disciples of all nations. And then he said something like this. He said, listen, you need to love your enemies. You need to love people. Don't think that, you, that you're pleasing God when you don't please man. Don't think that you mean something to the, to the kingdom if you don't love people. So how much flavor is enough? How much salt is enough? And the moment you read that, that this is the function or the, the form, this is, the, the, this is what Jesus is saying, listen, you need to bring flavor. Let me tell you something. Can I just bring, get a, a chair outside, please? A white chair. Then I can sit nicely. Because now I'm going to, a nice chair. Okay. I'm gonna, today we're going to teach. Is it okay? We're not going to preach. We're going to teach. And today, today my prayer for you is that you will walk out of this place, Jesus getting bigger, Jesus getting better, in your life, Amen. that the scriptures will get bigger. 
I don't want you to agree with everything that I say. That's not why we are preaching. I want you to wrestle so that Jesus can become bigger. Amen. Okay, here's the thing. How much flavor is enough? How much flavor, how much Jesus is enough? Thank you so much. How much flavor is enough? How much Jesus is enough? You said you must be the salt. How much salt? Not everybody at once. One tablespoon, that's a good amount. How much Jesus is enough? Okay, well done. We're getting there. See my soccer out. <laughs> so the moment we start reading the Bible as Jesus preached it, listen to what he said. Every offering, every sacrifice in the temple needed salt. So Jesus said this. He said, every sacrifice needs salt. That brings flavor to everything around it. The moment you sacrifice, it's like braai. It's like a nice braai. It brings a nice aroma. It brings nice flavor. It keeps the meat from rotting. and It's good. But every cup of salt in the temple had an expiry date. Every cup had an expiry date. A verfall datum. Something then becomes bad. Useless. And what they did was, they took that cup when there was no more use for it and they threw it outside on the steps of the temple. What happened was it absorbed the moisture but it actually helped people from not falling or slipping on the stairs. What is Jesus saying actually? He says your life will either be this, either bring flavor to everybody around it, or you'll be the example of people to trample and say, this is what I should not be like. Listen, he says, you must choose what salt you want to be, the salt that everybody can look at and say, if that is a Christian, I want to be like that, or you're either going to be this. If that is a Christian, I don't ever want to be that. He says, that choice is up to you. That salt is up to you. You make the choice. I'm not going to make the choice for you. And like we're going on with this sermon, I want to tell you today, I'm going to take something out of this sermon and I'm going to present it to you as not in, in heaven or hell because some of us have this idea that we just want to, I just don't want to, I, I, I just want to miss hell a little bit and just, just get to heaven because that is all my, my life journey is just this. I just don't want to sit in hell for the rest of my life. And Jesus said, listen, if you live like you're living at the moment, you're already experiencing hell. You're already experiencing hell. Don't wait for hell to come. Okay, let me just sit here on the big chair. Listen here. I don't say there's not a heaven. I don't say there's not a hell. I say when you live your life without Jesus, you're already experiencing hell. Of course Jesus is going to come. Of course Jesus is going to be there. Of course Jesus is going to set you free and you're gonna, he's going to take you there. I know the rapture is going to take place. I'm going to go with Jesus. And those who did not accept him is going to go to hell. But this is what, not what the Sermon on the Mount was all about. Jesus said this is a way of living. This is a way of people living their lives as a Christian or a non-Christian. Jesus present, presented something bigger than heaven or hell. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus presented something bigger than heaven or hell. Yo, now everybody is quiet. Because now we're going to throw me your stones and say, God's last turn. <laughs> no, listen here. One of the other things that I, that I, I want people to realize today, to this morning, this is how easy we can, we can misinterpret Scripture. It's so easy we can misunderstand what Jesus actually said. We, every, everybody knows the scripture, Romans 3 verse 14 says, And unto the angel of the church of the uh, Lodicians write, These things say the, uh, the amen, okay? Say the amen, amen, faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I said, And I know the works, <laughs> that thou art neither cold nor hot, and I would throw um, thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee from my mouth. 
And every Christian thinks to himself, how hot is lukewarm? Because we all read the scripture. Anybody heard of that? As long as you're hot or cold, but just don't ever be lukewarm. My question this morning is, how warm is lukewarm? How hot is hot? And I know what you're thinking. As long as I'm hotter than the girl, the girl or the guy next to me, I'm okay. If I look at the person next to me, I just want to be hotter than him. Yeah? Because that's how Christians do life. We look at people next to us and we think to ourselves, as long as I'm doing better than him, I'm going to be okay. How hot is lukewarm? Because of your salvation, if your salvation dependent on lukewarmness, some of us are in serious trouble. If heaven and hell dependent on your lukewarmness, some of us are in serious trouble. Because you know what you did last summer. Good joke. Some of you knew what you did yesterday. Some of you knew exactly what you did last weekend. So if your salvation depended on your lukewarmness, how warm is enough? Anybody want to answer that? Luckily, I know Christians. We just want to be better than the person next to us. True? Yes. As long as, long as I'm better than him, I'm going to be okay. But don't worry. It's like almost, like, almost like, like God knew exactly when he put in the scripture. He knew exactly what you were thinking. Let me tell you something. A new, a new way of thinking. So this scripture, the Laodiceans was in the middle. It was a it, it was surrounded by two other cities or two other towns. And for the mo this morning's sake, I'm going to explain something to you like this. This is the church, what the scripture is all about. Laodicea. Wait. Laodicea. On this way, on this, on this side, you, there's a city called Colossians. It was known for the uh, cold water. This city was known for its cold water. On the other side of Laodicea, there was a place called Hierapolis. They were known for their warm water. They were known for their uh, springs of warm water. The problem with Laodicea was the following. They did not have water. So they had to grow trenches from Colossian and from Hierapolis so they can have water. The problem with the cold water is when it flo flows and flows and flows, when it gets to Laodicea, how does it taste like? The cold water. How does it taste like? Lukewarm. Hierapolis was known for their warm water. There's springs of warm water. You can go and look it up if you don't believe me. Go and Google it tonight. They were known for their warm water. There's springs of warm water. So they grew trenches to Laodicea. The problem was when the water got to Laodicea, how did it taste like? Lukewarm. Good for nothing. The problem with the city was not the, uh, the warmness of its water. The problem was it had no water. Listen here. Some of us think that we need to be uh, hot or cold or whatever, as long as we're not luke, uh, lukewarm. But the thing is, Jesus was actually saying this. He said, your problem is not warm or cold. The problem is that you do not have water. You don't have anything to give to someone else. You don't have anything to, to, to live your life. There's nothing in your life that can, that can feed someone else. The problem is not your, the, 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 the hotness of your water or the coldness of your water. The problem was you had no water. And that's the thing that Jesus said, listen, we all want to see, uh, I just want to be warmer than this guy. 
But God said, listen here, the moment this water came to you, it was lukewarm, good for nothing. And the thing is, you think to yourself, oh God, I just want to be hotter than that, and I just want to be, no, no, God said, the problem is you do not have water. You have nothing to give to someone else. That's why Jesus said to this, the, the, the thing, he said, I'm going to give you the water, the water, and will, you will never ever thirst again. Why? Because your problem was not the, the warmness of your water. The problem was you had no water. Some Christians do not have water, the Spirit of God, to flow. We have nothing to give to the person next to you. That's why we struggle in life. That's why we struggle. Because now I want to I, I, I go to work with my Bible. I want to bash them. Hey, hey. This is what Jesus said. Hey. Look at all this Christian like me. I know exactly how we do life. Oh, brother. Oh, this is what God says. And then we just, oh. <laughs> and we get all spiritual. It means nothing. Nobody can drink from you. Jesus said, that's your problem. That's why people want to spit you out. Because there's no water. And the Spirit of God, he says, the Spirit of God draws all men unto him. Not push them away. It's the Spirit of God that draws men unto him. And you're asking yourself, why? Because you're pushing everybody away because you do not drink from the well of Jesus Christ. Because you do not have water. <laughs> now it gets quiet inside here. You don't have water. People can't drink from you because you're pushing everybody away. Because you're all religious. You think all your works. Oh, I'm known for this. Oh, I'm known for this. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I know all the scriptures by heart. Ooh. I know everything. Ooh. I'm, I'm warm. And you go that way. Oh, bro. This saith the Lord. This saith the Lord. Isn't it weird that every, all sinners were drawn unto Jesus? Kind of makes me think. We were missing it. All Christians were drawn unto Jesus. All sinners. And all the religious people wanted to kill him. It's almost like he presented something to say to his children, I've got a better way of doing life. I've got a better way to present the Father's heart than just heaven and hell. Think about this. If you want to take it yourself and quickly. You can take it yourself and quickly. If you want to make a note, I know that you're not going to make notes in your Bible. Take it yourself and don't, no, don't WhatsApp now and TikTok and whatever. <laughs> Take it yourself and, and you ask yourself one question this morning. If it wasn't for heaven or hell, Would I still be in love with Jesus? Would his teaching still be the things that you follow if that didn't mean that you're going to go to heaven or to hell? And just for the record's sake, for Facebook and whoever we're sending out to, there is a heaven, there is a hell. My question this morning, if it wasn't about that, would Jesus still be the number one person in your life? Would he still be the person that you fall in love with? Is still the person that you worship? Or will you just come to church so that we skip hell? We just pray so we skip hell. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the next two weeks we're going to do this. And the next two weeks we're going to explain to you 
When Jesus presented the Sermon on the Mount, he was actually giving you a better way of doing life. Nothing to do with heaven, nothing to do with hell. He said to you, listen, I'm going to present to you something that your life will improve the moment you follow these teachings. Not so that you one day will just, you, you, you just want to get to heaven. Because some people are so religious that they just want to go to heaven. They forget that they're still on earth and they need to, they, there's, a, there's a, a function that they need to do, uh, do on earth. So if it's not about heaven or hell, Jesus will take you to heaven. He will keep you out of hell. I do understand that. Can I just say that again? For the, for the video. Jesus will take you to heaven. He will keep you out of hell. The question that we're asking this morning, because I know how people are, they go out of the door and say, that guy said there's no heaven, there's no hell. No, no. There is a heaven, there is a hell. For sure. My question this morning is, if it wasn't for that, would Jesus still be the number one in your, in your life? Would you still follow his teachings? Would you still worship him? Will he still come to church? Would you still pray? Will you still build your marriage on that rock? Will you still do what you're doing now today? So in order for us to really understand the Sermon on the Mount, we need to go from, from the end to the beginning because every good book, read the last chapter, then you know exactly what's going to happen in the rest of the book. So just to read, read the last book, so what you're going to do is, we're going to read the last scriptures of the Sermon on the Mount because this is what I know. Me and my wife, we don't have many friends, unfortunately. So the moment friends come to visit, we make a big deal out of it. And I know what you're thinking. I want to be your friend. Here's the catch. The moment you come and visit us, you must bring the meat. You must bring the meat. I've got lots of children. You bring the meat, I'll provide the salad. Okay? Then it's a proper bring and bry. You bring the meat, you can bry. See, here's the thing. Okay, that's just my own thing. So, okay. That's why, I don't know if that's the reason why we don't have many friends, or maybe it's different reasons. But this is the thing. So one day, me and my wife said, listen, we're going to invite friends to come and visit us. It was over a Christmas holiday, and uh, they brought the meat. It was great. They had a lack of rye. And what we did is we recorded everything. Because we don't have many friends, so we want to tell other people, listen, we do have friends. We really do have friends. <laughs> Come and watch. <laughs> I'll show you. Okay, so this is the thing. So we recorded everything. In this whole episode, Saturday uh, afternoon, the bri was going, people were uh, uh, swimming, and then there was a moment when one of my kids pressed the recording button again and nothing recorded except this one thing. My youngest, the youngest of the, of the twin, he was going backwards on the swing and I, I pulled him off it and I gave him the fivefold ministry. And unfortunately, that was the only thing that was recorded on that video. Me pulling him on his leg and hoi. The dust was coming out of it. <laughs> unfortunately, this was the story. So if a person asked this person, I'm not going to mention names. One of our friends asked my other friend who was here that, that day. He said, listen, what type of a, a husband, what type of a father is Andres? And he said the following, no, he's a loving father. Wow, I've even got proof. And he played in the video of me pulling my kid and just, And in that moment, he said, I told you so. I told you he was a bad father. Look at it. He's a bad father. Look, at they even got video of him punishing his, his kids. And this is, what, this is the love that he gives his, his kids. 
the problem with the scenario is the following. Nobody knew what happened before and after that. Nobody knew that I'm standing, I'm waking up at five o'clock in the morning, praying for my family, praying for my kids, praying for them to be godly, to find purpose in life. Nobody knows that all that they do is they just see the video and they think this is the type of father that this guy is. And some of us read the Bible exactly like that. We get one scripture and say, this is who God is. Let me tell you, if you go and read Isaiah 1, you will have a big problem with God. You will have a big problem with this is the God. that says, I will have nothing to do with you. You are a bunch of ungodly children. I will have nothing to do with you. And some of us read the Bible exactly like that. Read the Bible. This is what God, this is the God that you are serving. This God that's so cruel to mankind. This is the God that you are serving. But nobody read Hosea 3. The God said, ah, oh, you know what I said about that time? I'm going to forgive you. I love you. And then we go a few chapters further, Hosea 11. You go and read it. It's, 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 a, it's a good book. And then in Hosea 11, God says, you know what I said about the first and third chapter? I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I love you so much. I love you so much. I'm going to send someone but nobody reads that because some of us make up our mind on the first scriptures that we read. And we think this is who God is. Some of us need to read the book to the end to understand the plan that God has for mankind. What am I trying to tell you? The Sermon on the Mount is exactly the same. The Sermon on the Mount, we need to read the, the last bit before we read the first bit. Otherwise, this the whole thing gets out of context. Otherwise, you don't understand what God is actually saying to us. So let's go. Enter you. Can I ask you to stand up and read, please, if it's okay? Yeah, go. Hoi. Okay, so let's, before you said, okay, so here Jesus is portraying something. He says, listen, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a narrow road and there's a broad road. And some of us understand this is, this is the way to hell and that's the way to heaven. This is the way, the broad road is the way to hell and the narrow road is the way to heaven. Here we go. Okay, go. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravaging wolves. Um, ye that know that by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is you down. <laughs> Next time can we do the amplified? <laughs> um, good fruit in you down and casteth into the fire. Whereforth by their fruit we shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay, just for this morning's sake, just before you said, for this morning's sake, we heard a lot of things Jesus said. This is the last part of the Sermon on the Mount, the best sermon Jesus ever gave. And then he, read something, he said something like this. He says, but he that doeth the will of the Father, which is in heaven. If you really want to know what this sermon is all about, he that doeth, the will of, uh, uh, do of, uh, the thing of my father, of the work of my father, he is doing a good thing. So go on. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that works iniquity. Lost. Okay, go. Therefore, whosoever heareth these saying of, sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came 
And the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat down upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Amen. You can sit. <laughs> Thank you. Enter ye in the straight gate. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way. So this morning, this is going to be the broad way. A way where everybody is going. And then he makes a difference. He says, and um, because it's straight and, 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 and this is a narrow way and which leadeth unto life and which they, uh, and whoever finds it, they will live. Okay. In Deuteronomy, I think it's 30 verse 19. The author of says says like this. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. This day I set, I lay before you life or death. The same picture, the same story. Listen here. Jesus is actually saying on this way, is a, there's a house going to be built on a rock. And this way, there's a house being built on sand. The Old Testament said like this, I put before you today life or death. You choose. Jesus said like this, there's a narrow way. Not everybody finds this, but this is the way of life. And this way is the broad way. It's almost like everybody finds it. This is the way of death. You choose. You choose. God will never ever force him onto you. Never ever. He says you choose which one you want to go to. You choose. I said this morning, everything in life is normal. Every normal thing is good. It's not really bad. The moment you look at normal, all your body parts, when they're in the right place, it's normal. Hello? It's not bad. Listen, if your lung is in your cough, then you've got a problem. So it's not good. Everybody is still okay with me. Everybody is still awake. Yes. Hallelujah, amen. Yes. Just say amen, hallelujah. Yes. Amen, hallelujah. So we're going we're gonna to preach. So now, well, see, here's the thing. Everything, not everything is normal. The moment you look at normal, it's like this. Your body parts, it's normal. Nothing wrong with it. You can sit here, your lung is in where it should be, your heart is where it should be, everything is normal. Washing your dishes, that's normal, that's good. Hello? Washing your dishes after you eat, that's good. Kissing your wife before you go to bed, that's good. Kissing your wife when you wake, when she wakes up. No, I'm joking, that's good. It's normal. Here's another thing. Doing your finances normal? Is that good or bad? Can I tell you something? The stats of South Africa is the following. For every rand that the normal person spends, <laughs> for every rand that he receives, he spends one rand fifty. Is that normal? It's normal. Is it good? No. Everybody's sleeping around. Is that normal? Yes. Is it good? No. Everybody says you, for you to survive in this life, you need to do business unethically. Is that normal? Yes. Is it good? No. So Jesus said the following. He says, you must understand something. There will always be a decision that you need to make intentionally. There will always be a place that you will need to choose between life and death. There will always be a place to the normal for every pers young person here today. Every, any young person here, people here today? 
under to the age of 24. 24? Everybody under the age of 24. If every, now let's give them a hand. Listen, if every person is sleeping around, is that normal? Yes, but Jesus said, if that's normal, you need to change, you need to choose the different route. If everybody, because he said, this road, this road is broad and everybody's going that way. But you need to do life differently. You need to do life in a different angle. The normal for you is the supernatural that God has given you. You need to do life supernaturally because it's unnatural for you to say, no, I'm not going to do business like this. No, I'm not going to sleep around. No, I'm going to, put, I'm going to turn my other, the, my, my other cheek. No, I'm not going to do it like everybody else is doing it. Is it good for you to move in together before you are married? Is it normal? Yes. Is it good? No, because I want to tell you something. Every young person, listen here. If I tell you today, if I tell you today, I'll, if you get into your car now, if you get into your car right now, and, 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 and you're going to drive from here to the KFC just down the road, down the road, and I promise you today, 80% of you will not make it. 80% of you will not make it to the KFC today. Will you get into your car? Why? Because you love life, isn't it? Hello? Because you love life. Yes, I don't want to die today. No, no, no. i still got lots of things to do. Yes, yes. But what if I tell you the stats on your marriage is exactly the same? If you move into, into uh, with another person before you are married, listen here, the stats is the following. 80% of you will not make it. Yo. 80% of your marriage will not last. You don't want to get into, to go to the KFC but you want to spend the rest of your life with the most important person, but the stats is the same. Yo, I didn't come for this, Andres. No, I want to present to you something that Jesus said. Choose a different way. If everybody's going that way, maybe that's a good idea to not go that way. If everybody's going that way, that's a, good, uh, that's a good indicator for you to say, I'm not going to do it. Young people, listen here. We always think that we are the 20%. We always think the odds is for us. Jesus said that's exactly the same as you trying to build a house on sand. Jesus said it's exactly the same. You always think, oh, the sand will keep my house safe because no storm will ever hit me. No storm will ever come against my, my marriage. No storm will ever come against my, my relation. No storm will ever come against my finances. No storm will ever come against. And we always think the stats is for us. But Jesus said, you're trying to build a house. You're trying to build a house on sand. You're trying to build your house on something that's not solid. How many of you have ever tried to build a house like this? Put one brick and you step back and say, come on, look, this is my house. Come and look at my house. Please, William, come and look at my house. Come. Look at my house. What do you think? Yeah, I'm simply mask if you come out. <laughs> what do you think about my house? It's nice, but it's only one brick. You're calling me a liar. No. You're calling me a liar. Listen here, how many of us has built our houses on one brick, never ever been through a storm, and we think that we have made it? We build, we put one brick there, and we think, this is it, I've made it. This life, I've made it. 
And you think, I want to tell you, the moment you start building your house, because it's a brick upon a brick upon a brick upon cement upon cement upon brick upon brick upon brick. And the thing is that we as children of God, we think that the moment there's one brick there, oh, we are safe. We just got saved. Oh, praise the year. Hallelujah. And then we just go like this. Because the moment you got your hand there, you know that you're charismatic. Can we do this? Yes. Charismatic. All charismatic. This is the indication for the charismatic movement that you are saved and you're spiritual. (laughs) Other people are waving at me. I'm joking. Okay. Some of us got saved and you think that our houses are built. Some of us just got saved and you think, oh, this is it. Now everything is going to be great and everything is going to be strong and everything. And Jesus said, no, 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 wait. For you to build a house, you need more than one brick. For you to build a house, you need to be, there needs to be intentionally being, uh, building brick upon brick. Some of us need to wake up this, uh, tomorrow morning and have an intentional uh, uh, decision to do things differently. If everybody's doing it like this, then you need to do it differently. And the thing is that some of us need to do this in our relationships, in our relationship with God, in our finances. We need to do things differently than way we did it yesterday. Listen, uh, some of us think that this one big compass uh, is, is, is our, uh, our whole house. And it's not. Your house does, does not consist out of one brick. Your walk with God does not exist just by you getting saved. Hello, Christians. Your walk with God does not consist of one encounter with God. It's a lifetime of building, a lifetime of a facing storm, a lifetime of saying, God, I want to get more of you. I want to have more of you. God, I want to build my life. And this is what Jesus says. He says, the one that is, that is saved, he needs to build his life intentionally. Thank you. Normal is good. Normal is good. My time is almost up. Normal is good, except when you're building. Normal is good, except when you're building your life with Christ. How many of us have started a life and we think everything's okay? And we don't understand why a life is not working out for you. We can't understand why this life has always got the same problems over and over and over and over again. When Jesus said, uh, narrow is the way, and next week we're going to talk about gates, and we're going to talk about um, foundations. The moment Jesus said, narrow is the way, it was like all the roads lead to one place. And for you to go through into the city, you need to be intentional. You need to do things intentionally. You need to wake up tomorrow morning and say, God, this is, what I'm stand for. this is what I stand for. This is what Christianity is all about for me. This is Christianity for me. The thing is, in the moment the, uh, when the storm comes, we try to put everything together. We quickly want to put more bricks and more everything. And then it's too late. This is what Jesus is actually saying. He says, listen, if you want to build your house, about, uh, uh, build your house in every storm, you're going to fail at life. You're going to fail at life. And you're going to ask, God, where are you? But God says, this is before the storm strikes. You need to have a house that was built on a rock. Not to let your life be defined by every storm. Because some of our Christians do life like that. The moment the storm hits, you cry out for a miracle. You cry out to God, and it's good to cry out to God. My question this morning is, how does your foundation look? How does the brick look in your house? People will ask me, Andres, you're so lucky. 
Your kids are serving the Lord. You're so lucky. 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 Lucky is a horse and TV, man. Lucky is a horse or cigarettes in the old times. Lucky. It's intentional. Wake up in the morning, five o'clock, pray for your kids. Intentional. It's nothing like luck in life. Intention. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, how does intention look like you, uh, for you? Who like Christians got for you? How does the foundation look like? We look at other people and say, oh, they're so lucky. The ray of light of God is shining upon them. And God says, no, it's a house that was built on a rock. Intentional. Oh, God's just got his favorites. One thing I want to tell you, the more I spend time with God, the more I read my Bible, the more I, I, I act on God's principles. Isn't it weird what Jesus said? He said, in the end, he said, and the people marveled at what he said. But just before the Jesus said this, he said, listen, don't just hear what I say, do what I say. The biggest problem in Christianity today is the following. People hear from God, but they don't act. Christians, I want to tell you something. The most dangerous place that any Christian can ever find himself is when you can hear from God, but you don't act. It's when you can hear so clearly from God. And you decide to do, do, do something different. Jesus said, don't just listen. Don't just listen. Your faith is built up, is, is, is made up of more than just believing. Even the demons believe. It's how you treat other people. It's how you're doing life. How you do life speaks more about your faith in Jesus than what you believe. I want to close off with this, and then we are finished. I know our time is so is up. Matthew seven verse nine. It says, "Oh, what, or what man is there of you whom his his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if you ask for a fish, will he give him a serpent?" If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which in heaven give good things to them that ask of him? And then I said something there at the back, at the bottom. He says, how you think about God directly reflect and project towards others. How you perceive God. If you believe that God will give you a rock instead of a fish, this is how you're going to reflect God towards others. Can I say that again? If you believe that God is a racist, you will betray racism but, uh, uh, onto other people. If you believe that God has got this whole, there's only this one nation and no one else, you will betray it against your brothers and your sisters. If you believe that God is not a man of his word, guess what? You will betray it towards other people. How you perceive God. How you perceive God. Listen, listen. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, in heaven, in heaven, there's going to be a table, pretty big table, pretty sure of it. And then on that table, there's going to be people from every tribe and every tongue. Every race, every language. My question to you this morning is, will that be heaven or hell to you? How will that be for you? Will that be heaven? Or will it be hell? How 
we see God is how we reflect it towards other people. If you see God as a loving father, guess what? You will betray it to other people. It will be your reflection. If God is peace, God is peace. In the midst of a lockdown, you will betray him as peace. How you see your Father in heaven. This is what the scripture is actually saying. If you think that God will always do something else than what is not, that is what you will do. But this morning, I want to ask every person to bow his head quickly. I know our time is long gone. this morning is the following as God is putting before you life and death heaven or hell light or darkness but this morning he's asking you the question you choose you need to decide this morning it's not about anybody else it's about you and God. And then God whispers, like He whispered in Deuteronomy 30. He says, But choose life. Choose life. Now, this morning, I want to ask you if there's any person here this morning that have never ever accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. You have never accepted him. I want to ask you to raise your hand quickly. Just a person. I want you to just raise your hand quickly. 